Hi, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for coming in to do this. Um, we had an introduction through a good mutual friend of mine, and uh, this is a, a little bit more of a more serious story than something we usually cover. But I think it's something uh, we should talk to people about on the show. I think human trafficking is obviously a complicated and terrible subject. Uh, there's a lot of victims, and uh, I think it's important for you to come here and, and tell people about the great work you're doing. So. I usually sit here with a pile of questions, but I think with this one, I just want you to tell your story and then we'll dig into it. Tell, just give the background on how you this became a subject you wanted to work on. Yeah, I you know I knew virtually nothing about human trafficking uh, really until graduate school and began to travel, uh, especially in the developing world, with uh, some other students and friends. And um, in my case, the first case I came uh, came across was a case involving a, a 12 year old girl who uh, was from a very poor family. Her family sends her to the big city for the summer to get a job where she could earn some money that she could bring home, home to the family. And so she gets a job in a restaurant washing dishes and earns some summer money and then is getting ready to head back home to her family. And to do that, she's got to catch a train from Victoria Station in Mumbai, which is a very, very crowded train station. I think something like a million people a day are going through this station. And she's just kind of confused by the chaos. She can't find her train. A couple of older ladies see her struggling and approach her and say, hey, are you doing okay? And she says, well, I can't find my train. They say, well, where are you going? And she tells them. And she said, oh, they said, oh, well, we know where that is. That's on, actually on the same line that we're on. We'll show you. And so she's kind of relieved to have these ladies looking out for her. And so she hops on the train. They start chatting. They have some tea. And it turns out the tea is drugged. And so she's knocked out cold. And when she wakes up, she finds herself on the third floor of a brothel in the red light district where she's been sold for the equivalent of 250 American dollars. And from that point forward, the trafficker tells her, you're now going to service the customers at the brothel. And she says, I just want to go home. And he says, that's not really an option for you anymore. I paid good money for you. You're now going to make money for me. And, and he sets a quota. She has to service seven to 12 men a day, seven days a week. At 12 years old. At 12. And, you know, and meanwhile, here's her family at the rural train station. Has no idea where she is. They don't know why she's not on the train. They have, and they don't even know how to start looking for her. And, you know, as I learn about that story, it just, it made my blood boil. I thought, how, how do you do that to a 12-year-old? How, how did you come across the story, though? Um, a friend of mine had started an organization that was starting to look uh, at, proactively for these kinds of cases. And it was through him that I learned about this story. And it just, uh, you, you just, you hear a story like that and you feel like in a world of moral gray, there's a lot of moral gray, there's a lot of nuance. This is pretty black and white. And it's pretty clear to me that 12 year old shouldn't be there. And so there, there was a big part of me that was like, whatever it takes, we have to get her out right now. You can't, you can't let that continue. And then you start to learn about the scope of the problem and you hear, oh, there's 25 million people who are in that same position today. And all of a sudden, there's, it, it's like your soul is divided into two parts. One part is going, get her out now. The other part is going, wait a second, you, you can't get too close to this. Because 25 million victims, like whatever, whatever they do, it's just going to be a drop in the ocean. It's not really going to make a difference. It's, it's like getting too close to a fire that you can't put out. You got to back away. You're going to get burned. And I think as long as, I, as you're in that position, it's a very painful position to be in, to feel like there's something that's horrible that's happening that has to be stopped. And at the same time, I don't feel that there's anything meaning. I feel very powerless and feel like there's nothing that I can meaningfully do to put a dent in it. And that is a, you know, just a very painful position to be in. And for whatever reason, for me, I felt this, you know, really probably for the only time in my life, this clear sense of like, hey, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. And I thought, well, maybe it's just an emotional high and it'll go away. And then it just never did. So at that point, it changed uh, the course of my life. I was at that time in a graduate program in the UK at Oxford and left that early to go to law school really with the idea of being involved in this type of work. So eventually, after clerking for a judge and, and being in the private sector for a number of years, moved to DC in 2007 to join the US Department of Justice, which was just forming its first ever human trafficking prosecution unit. So this was the first group of federal prosecutors that would focus exclusively on human trafficking. And, and for almost a decade, that was, my, that was my job. I'd get up on a Monday morning, travel around the country, uh, work with a team of federal agents, FBI agents, Homeland Security agents. And we just started working these cases from start to finish. And Domestic or international? 
uh, there were cases where the victims were here. Some of the victims were from other countries, but ended up here. And a lot of the victims were domestic. And actually, that was something that was quite surprising to me. I think a lot of the news stories and maybe you know, movies you see would make you think, and even the name itself, trafficking, sounds like it's about movement. It sounds like it's about crossing borders. And yet, the vast majority of victims never cross a border of any kind. And really, I learned that that's because traffickers are really in it to make money. It's an economic crime. It's a cost-benefit crime. And so they kind of think of it like a business model. So if you're a trafficker, you're thinking, hey, I want to make money. Maybe I'll do that through commercial sex, which we call sex trafficking. Maybe I'll do it through some other industry, a hotel, a restaurant, a brick kiln. But either way, I need laborers to do it. And I've got a fundamental choice. I could either use voluntary laborers, so I got to pay some kind of competitive wage to and keep them happy or they'll go somewhere else. Or I could use force and threats and violence, coerce them to work for me and prevent them from leaving. Well, as long as there's no real consequence for that, then all my labor costs magically get turned into profits. So I'm just going to make more money. And so that's why when we look at sort of the global landscape, what we see is that trafficking just explodes in places where the laws are not enforced. It doesn't really matter for the traffickers whether there's laws in the books as long as those laws are not enforced. So it sounds... Um it sounds like slavery is a is essentially a component of trafficking. Yeah, uh, and there's debates about whether what the right terminology yeah. is, but yeah, I think there's a large group that calls this modern slavery, and and really at the heart of the crime, it really is about overcoming the will of another person. It's about taking away their freedom to make choices about where they work, what they do, who touches their body, and so fundamentally, it really is about control of another person and robbing them of their freedom. Yeah, so the, the traditional kind of cases I've heard about is Eastern European girls being moved across Europe uh, for sex work, uh, maybe South Americans being moved, uh, again, traditionally for sex work, uh, occasional cases of children. I've, I've heard a number of cases uh, with regards to India. What Can you just give me an idea of the, like the range of uh, cases and who it affects? Is it, is it mainly women, mainly women and children? Or is it there a surprising number of like adult men who are trafficked? What's the range we're dealing with here? Yeah, so if you think of human trafficking as the umbrella term, and you think of the two buckets within that as sex trafficking and labor trafficking, about 20% of the world's victims are sex trafficking victims. Okay. The other 80% are labor. And really, that's not surprising if you think about it, because really, it's the same business model. What we've done is really just take one specific type of behavior, which is commercial sex, and say, so we're going to isolate that specific uh, industry, so to speak, and we're going to call that sex trafficking. And then every other, you know, arena, we're going to call labor trafficking. So that includes every other type of industry from agriculture to domestic servitude to, uh, you know, hotels or restaurants, everything else gets called labor trafficking. So on the sex trafficking side, the evidence is that it's, it's the victims are overwhelmingly female. On the labor trafficking side, it's a more even split. Now, even on the sex trafficking side, there are, are non-female victims. There are, there are boys and there are others who are, who are targeted for, uh, for sex trafficking. Uh, but on the labor trafficking side, it's a, it's a, it tends to be a more even split. In terms of geographic distribution, this is one of the shockers for me. Uh, when I was at the Justice Department, I had an opportunity to take a sabbatical and work on a book that I wrote with a friend of mine called The Locust Effect, Why the End of Poverty Requires the End of Violence. And in, the, in that book, we looked at the global landscape and discovered that 93% of the world's victims are actually in developing countries, which blew my mind. Because you think about that, that means that even if somehow we magically could eviscerate all trafficking in the United States and the UK and Western Europe and Australia, Japan, we'd still have 93% of the victims out there, which means we really can't impact trafficking at scale if we're not impacting traffickers in the developing world. Is there any form of voluntary trafficking for consideration here. So for example, there are people who want to move across Europe trying to get into the UK. We know there are gangs which help people kind of cross uh, cross from France into the UK uh, on crappy boats. Uh, we had a uh, quite a sad case over a few months ago where, where a boat sunk. I think about 30 people died. If it is that considered part of trafficking, even if it's Voluntary, even if the person wants to pay to be trafficked. So trafficking itself can never be voluntary. Okay. Now, there's a different crime called smuggling, which yeah. I think is kind of what you're referring to. Okay. Smuggling is really a crime against the borders, and that can happen either voluntarily or involuntarily. So someone can say, yes, I, please help me. I'd like to be crossed even illegally across a border into another country. 
that's a smuggling operation. It necessarily involves the crossing of a border and it can be voluntary or involuntary. With trafficking, no movement is required, no crossing of borders is required. Really the essence of the crime is coercion. It's about using force or threats or violence to coerce someone either into commercial sex or into some other form of labor. And that can happen to the person next door. So no crossing of any kind of border is required. Movement is really not an element of the crime at all. Now there's a Venn diagram, as you can imagine, where yeah. there are cases that involve both smuggling and trafficking, but the terms themselves, in fact, the term trafficking is, is often, it does sound like it's about movement. And so uh, nine times out of 10, you pick up a story and you read it in the newspaper and it's talking about trafficking and you dig into the facts and it's really a smuggling case. So I think there's a lot of confusion around that term, but they're really two distinct crimes that sometimes overlap. Okay, in the bucket of uh, uh, labor uh, trafficking, when you discussed 93% being in the developing world, I actually wasn't surprised about that. I, I'm actually surprised that cases really do exist in the developed world. Uh, I mean, I know stuff would be, but I would have thought it'd be extremely rare just because we live in a developed you know, Western liberal democracy. Uh, you, uh, I, I say outside of sex work because I understand the coercion there, but I would have thought most people could escape these situations if they didn't want to be. What do I not understand about how this works and how people are coerced? Well, I think one challenge for us, especially in the West, is that this crime is by its very nature very hidden. So, the, you know, unlike say a natural disaster where, you know, the tsunami is not hiding itself, the tornado is not hiding itself, it's very visible for people to see. Often other humanitarian disasters are very visible. But in this particular case, you have a trafficker who is deliberately working to hide from view the crimes that are taking place. So for instance, in labor trafficking, you may never see the person who, who makes up your room, cleans your room at the hotel, or you may never see the person washing the dishes in the back of the restaurant. And even in the cases of commercial sex, where there's force or violence coerce, coercing them, there's also a lot of pressure by traffickers for their victims to appear enthusiastic about the commercial sex interaction and there's punishment and, and harm to them if they don't. And so for that reason, it's often very, very hard for us to see. And in this tragic irony, the victims are often so, feel, feel so ashamed and embarrassed by what's happened to them that they also wanna hide it from view. So almost all the human actors that are involved in the process are all sort of deliberately hiding it from view. And that's why, one, one reason why it's very hard for us to see, and we feel like, well, gosh, I, you, you travel a lot, I travel a lot, why are we not seeing more of it? And the reason is because it's so hidden, you've really got to know how to look for it and you've got to develop even specialization in enforcement to go out and find it. So it's one of those crimes, unlike a bank robbery where someone raises their hand and says, hey, hey, I'm the victim of a bank robbery, crime has been committed, come let me tell you about it. It, you've really got to develop proactive investigative strategies to go out and find it because it is so hidden. And what are the components of the trafficking? There, my assumption is that there is the person who finds people to coerce and traffic, there is the act of moving people if it is required, and there is the person recruiting. Uh, can the person recruiting not realize they're recruiting people that have been trafficked? Or is it always uh, like multiple parties complicit. No, it can, it's not, you know, so there's different roles and sometimes all those roles are worn by, uh, all those hats are worn by the same person. So okay. you may have one person that's doing the recruiting. In the case that I mentioned to, to start the, to start our, our, our conversation together, the 12 year old girl, you had the, the two older ladies who are drugging and abducting this girl and delivering her to the red light district. Now they obviously know that she's underage and that she doesn't want to do this. Uh, but they also know there's a predictable buyer on the other end. And so they're they're willing to undertake all that effort and risk because they know there's a predictable buyer on the other end who will buy that that victim. The trafficker himself also knows here's a 12-year-old. The, the, this is the brothel owner. He knows it's a 12-year-old. She's under, unconscious. She's, she's underage. She doesn't want to be here. But from his perspective, he thinks I can command this kind of revenue, uh, and to put it in really crass economic terms, but that's how they think from this person. And so I'm gonna make back the money, my initial capital investment, I'm gonna have a, a great ROI uh, on this on this victim, uh, return on investment on this victim. And so uh, from their perspective, it's th they, they, they all know that they're involved. Now, is it possible that you could have a recruiter who is hired by, uh, by, by a trafficker and doesn't realize that they're recruiting for a trafficking operation? Yeah, it's possible that you have, so there are possible that you have people along the line who are unwittingly, um, facilitating, uh, which is not a crime if it's genuinely unwitting and unknowing. 
um, but you also have sort of knowing facilitators. And now that's in the US, um, that itself is a crime. Right, okay. Um, and with regards to, let's talk about say the US, uh, can you give, just give me some examples of uh, specific labor crimes that you've seen with regards to trafficking? Just to, so I understand the picture. Because I think it, I think sex trafficking will cover separately, and I think that's that's an easier area to tr- try and get come to some assumptions with. But labor trafficking, uh, with regards to you talked about agriculture or farming, yeah. that's why I, I uh, specifically asked, like, could a hotel owner not realize they're recruiting people that have been trafficked? Yeah, so uh, we do see, uh, and and we put together actually a report called the Federal Human Trafficking Report, which is now mapped out 20 years of cases of, it's actually every single federal human trafficking case since the law was created in the year 2000. And we kind of map out the trends there. And that's available online for those who want to dig in more deeply to the data. I know this is a community that's that's very Mm data-driven. And so uh, traffickinginstitute.org is our website, and they can go check that out there. It's the Federal Human Trafficking Report. So you can see sort of the breakdown of what are the most common industries. But yeah, agricultural is is a common industry. So you may have agricultural workers that are are coerced uh, into operating in a in a tobacco field or 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 in a in, in some other agricultural enterprise, you've got domestic servants. These are these are folks who are you know cleaning or caring for children who are sort of doing kind of nanny and cleaning services and that sorts of those sorts of things that are also we see trafficking in the in those industries. I did a case uh, early on in my career at the Justice Department involving uh, a restaurant owner that was coercing laborers from overseas into. Uh, to working at the restaurant for virtually no wages and, you know, was, was, was preventing them from leaving. And so those are examples of kind of different industries that this takes place on the labor side here in the U.S. And that may look a little different as you move out into the rest of the world. Um, but the model, the business model is, is always the same, which is the traffickers thinking I'm going to make more money by coercing the victim and saving labor costs than I, than I would if I paid voluntary laborers to do this. So, are there, are there specific things that make it easy to identify if something is coercion? Does it come down to the the rates of wage? Like, how do you actually? Because I'm assuming again within that, there's some things that feel it's not easily identifiable. It's not simply a labor violation, like oh, I didn't, you know, cross my eye, cross dot my eyes and cross my t's on the laborer. I underpaid them, or I didn't pay overtime like I'm supposed to. It's really it, there's an objective component and a subjective component to it. Yeah. So the objective component is. Uh, you know, would a, would a reasonable person in those circumstances feel like they weren't really free to leave or to do something different? And so the types of coercion that traffickers use are actually quite ingenious. I, um, I remember we had, there was a case uh, where the defense attorney in, in his closing argument was trying to argue that his, def- the, his client was not a, had not committed trafficking. And, and he, he said, it's not like he held a gun to, to her head 24 hours a day. And if you think about it, the cost of having someone who would hold a gun to someone's head 24 hours a day is actually quite incredibly expensive, right? That's very, very onerous. And so traffickers are thinking, are there there much more efficient ways that I can coerce someone? So, you know, can I say, hey, look, uh, if, you know, uh, if you don't, sometimes you'll have like a a smuggling operation where they say, okay, you, you mortgage your house or you mortgage your family's, you know, mortgage some money for your family to pay to get to, say, the U.S. And then they say, okay, you're stuck here until you pay off this debt. And so you have this form of debt servitude. And uh, often they'll charge, you know, exorbitant interest. And then you have to stay where I tell you to stay. And that's going to cost you this. And then you got to take the food that I'm, I'm going to require you to eat. And that's going to cost this. And so you end up working for free for sometimes decades because you are never even making a dent in this debt. And sometimes you have victims who don't have uh, um, the resources or background or experience or education to, to really say, well, let me, I'd like to press into that more. And of course, there's sometimes threats of violence to you or to your family back home if you, if you push back against those things. So those are some of the different uh, elements that we see of ways that traffickers will use to coerce and, and traffickers come up with increasingly ingenious ways to coerce their victims uh, over time. Does that become difficult to prosecute? Is there a, a high success rate on prosecutions? 
Yeah, the here in the U.S. there is. So okay. here in the U.S., the the conviction rate is quite high, and that's because there's also quite a quite a high standard for even bringing a case in the first place. And so uh, these cases, uh, what we found is that specialized units make a huge difference in the difference in the success of these cases because the way that you build them from the very beginning of the investigation all the way through trial is actually quite specialized. And so when you have a specialized team that of of police and prosecutors and victim specialists that are all working together to bring the case to forward, then that's where you sort of have your highest success rates. But the conviction rate is actually quite high here in the US. Yeah. And how do they even investigate and find? Is it is it um, people to reporting? Is, I mean, it's, it sounds like a comp, if you, if you said, as you said before, it's hidden, yes. then how do you find it? Well, there's a variety of different ways. So we do sometimes get reports either from victims or from third parties who recognize something is off. You know, they see like, well, how come this domestic servant at this person's house like never goes out? They never, I never see them. I don't see them going for a walk. I don't see them you know, getting, getting, seeing any friends. I don't see them walking to church. I don't see them doing, like, it's kind of weird. You know, I, I yeah. want to go to their house. I don't see them. And so you'll have people who just notice something off and they'll report it. And that's kind of sparks an investigation. Uh, you'll have cases where uh, the healthcare system notice something. You have, you have someone who's, who's now injured or you have sometimes forced abortions or, or some other sort of medical procedure that's required for a victim. And the trafficker shows up and, You'll have a medical personnel who 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 are like that doesn't really make sense. Like this, it's he she's saying it's his, it's her older brother, but it doesn't seem like an older brother relationship to me. And they'll separate them and then start to get information that leads to a trafficking investigation. Uh, and then you have you have now proactive undercover operations where you're going out and actively proactively looking for it. Where you have law enforcement that are, are going in and and attacking a specific business model and trying to find it. And that's where I think you'll start. We'll, we we see some 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 great results as well. Okay. And and if anyone was listening, or myself, anyone here, like, are there things you want the public to be more aware of? Do you think that this is something we have as a collective duty just to to observe and report? Are there things we that I, you say it's hidden, but we may miss? But if we you know learn to recognize them, that we could perhaps help. Yeah. Honestly, I think. Um, People do talk about like specific things to look for, and and I I would inc- you know encourage some of those things. So if you see it, but a lot of times it's a spidey sense. It's kind of a this doesn't seem right. Like the the nurse just kind of knew that this story didn't add up. And the thing that really made the difference is she did something about that spidey sense. So she said, "Gosh, this doesn't do this doesn't sound right." So I'm going to actually take the next step and make the call to the human trafficking hotline and try and, and figure out. You know, here's here's what we here. You know, and just do my duty, and I'm going to put it in their hands, and the experts can take it from there. Uh, but often you sort of suppress that. You're like, well, I don't know. Maybe he, maybe he is the brother. I don't know. I don't want to mess. I don't want to mess up something here. And so you sort of just stay passive. So I do think it's great for folks if they do see something off to to just go ahead and report it and let the let the uh, law enforcement professionals kind of jump in and and, and take a look. Um, and so I think that's a wise thing to do. But I think the other thing is just the more that we can actually concentrate resources in the specialized units that that's all they do is they go out and they they know how to look for it. They know how to find it. They, they, they're, they're crafting proactive investigative operations to go after it. That's I, I think that's where we'll see our biggest yield. Okay. Let's, um, let's talk specifically now about sex work. To, I want to understand a bit more about that. So there's a lot of discussion and I've had it covered on my show and some people believe sex work should be decriminalized, should be legalized, that would protect people, that would uh, re- reduce uh, risk for sex workers. There's other people who think there sh- it shouldn't be and it should be criminal. Um, is there any data or evidence that leads to kind of like helpful conclusions with this kind of question? On the decriminal on the decriminalization question, we actually uh, we hosted a little debate on that front. Uh, with uh, we have some fellows who are just exceptional law students that are our Frederick Douglass fellows, and we did we did a debate on that at the University of Virginia. And so there definitely are are very interesting, compelling arguments on both sides. The one caution I would have is I do hear the argument that well, if it were legalized, that would reduce the amount of trafficking. And I at least in my experience, um, there's reasons to really question that and. When I was at the Justice Department, we had actually uh, a group from the Netherlands of prosecutors and police reach out. And uh, there's actually a, a Harvard Kennedy School professor who kind of brokered a conversation where they said, look, we've got this problem, which is we've legalized um, uh, commercial sex work. 
And yet it really hasn't reduced trafficking. We still have essentially the regulated sex industry that's taking place here. And then you have this unregulated underground sex industry, which includes uh, sex trafficking, where there's force and coercion and uh, people who are victims that's also taking place. Which, if you think about it, makes sense because if you're a trafficker, you're thinking, well, if I go the regulated route, I've got to pay taxes. I've got to. I, I've got a smaller group of victims that I can choose from, uh, and I've got to pay wages, right? And so, whereas if I can operate underground and use force and threats and violence, I've got a larger group of people I can pull from. I can. I can go after children as well as adults. I can create violent pressure that prevents me from having to pay them. So all that my labor costs turn into profits, I don't have to pay taxes. And so it, it becomes a, a similarly kind of lucrative enterprise. So I think the Netherlands, at least the, with, the, with that group, kind of it, that stuck out in my mind as hmm, maybe this is not a panacea to solving the trafficking component of what's happening in, in sex work. And from my perspective, what does change that is when you have, and I think there is data on this, that when you have increased enforcement against sex trafficking, that is where there is forced mm -hmm. fraud or coercion or where there's underage victims, what you're doing is you're really shifting the demand of the trafficker for forced laborers. So let's say, to go back to that original example with, of the 12-year-old in the brothel in India, let's say that we start, we send a specialized unit and they start really cracking down on trafficking, sex trafficking, that is victims like, like this 12 year old who are underage or who are using, who are being coerced there. Now, what, how does that change the business model of the, the brothel owner when those two ladies come and show up with an unconscious 12 year old girl? Well, once that happens, he says, wait a second, she's 12, she's underage, she didn't want to be here? Not interested because I take her, now all of a sudden this specialized unit could come in and seize all my assets. And I lose my entire, all my revenue, my entire business, my family, my freedom, go to jail for maybe the next 15 years. Not interested. When all I have to do to avoid that risk is shift to voluntary laborers exclusively. That is those who are making some kind of economic decision to engage in, in, in sex work. And then I avoid that risk altogether. Well, the moment he makes that choice, these ladies are only willing to undertake all that effort and risk if they know there's a predictable buyer on the other end. So if he once that dries up, so does their incentive to go out to the train station and and, and look for 12-year-olds that they can that they can drug and, and bring to the, the red light district. So that's where I think we can make a tremendous difference is when you increase enforcement, it really changes the risk calculus for traffickers. It doesn't eliminate sex work, but it does really decimate the component of sex work that's that's really using force and threats and violence and coercion and underage victims to engage in commercial sex. And so, so how do you do that? How do you have greater enforcement? Well, the thing that was quite interesting to me is when I first started at the Justice Department, we had this you know quite interesting challenge, which I was traveling around the country and you'd see these prosecutors and agents who seemed like, wow, working a trafficking case, that's a pretty morally compelling thing to work on. If that's out there, I'd like to, you know, that's the kind of case I'd like to work on. And yet we were seeing very few cases and we're trying to figure out what's, what's the disconnect. We've got good laws. We've got smart, motivated prosecutors and agents. Why are we not seeing more cases? And what we discovered is it's just a, it's a very specialized area of law, law enforcement. And that's not that unusual, but normally when you have a specialized area of law enforcement, you create a specialized unit. So you'll have a narcotics unit or an organized crime unit that's gonna focus on a specialized area of crime. Well, what happens when the enforcement of the crime is still so new that there's just no one down the hall. I can't walk down the hall and say, hey, Peter, you're our expert on, on trafficking cases. How do you do this? How do we even start? How do we go find this stuff? And when there's no one down the hall, you don't want to screw up professionally, especially when there's a bunch of very traumatized victims on the other end. And so the cases weren't happening. So what we did is we, we worked together uh, at the Justice Department with some other uh, federal agencies to create a pilot. We went to the 94 federal districts in the U.S. and we said, hey, you guys compete for six slots that will participate in the pilot. And those pilot districts will do three things. First, we'll just kind of almost build a mini specialized unit. Here's our team, here's our prosecutors, here's our federal agents, we're now gonna work on trafficking cases. And then secondly, we'd walk them through, here's the strategies and interventions and tools that we've seen that, that actually are effective. And then the third thing is, they'd go back to their home districts and we'd pair them up with me or another prosecutor in our national unit, and we'd fly out there and just roll up our sleeves and start working cases together. And of course, there's all kinds of problems that come up that you never anticipated in the classroom, but now at least you have someone with you who can help you push through those problems and move your cases forward. So two years in, we pulled the data to see, okay, has this made a difference? And what we discovered is that those six pilot districts had really hit it out of the park. So we saw a 114% increase in the number of traffickers charged in the pilots 
compared with 12% in the rest of the country. In fact, those six districts had produced more convictions than the other 88 federal districts combined. So we're like, okay, this is working. And that's slowly spreading in the US, but where it was not spreading was in developing countries where 93% of the world's victims were. And that's what really motivated me to leave the Justice Department and launch Human Trafficking Institute to really try to solve that problem, to take that successfully piloted model that we'd seen work well in the US to countries that had really good anti-trafficking laws who were motivated to increase enforcement, even for self-interested reasons, and we can talk more about that in a second, but just didn't have access to the model or the expertise to do it. So that's what we do now at Human Trafficking Institute. We now partner with developing countries essentially to do those same three things. We help them vet and build specialized units, walk them through some very concrete skills training and strategy training, and then I hire former FBI agents, former prosecutors who move to that country and by agreement with the government, begin to work directly with those units day in and day out on their cases, helping them build their skills, solve case-related challenges, and also create that transparency and accountability that helps protect against corruption risk. And then we measure that from start to finish to see if it's working. That's uh, quite a big move though, to go and create the Human Trafficking Institute. Uh, how did you even start? I mean, because I guess one of the key issues is funding. Yeah, it was, um, I'm not going to lie, Peter, it was, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was the big, that was the big hang up because for a decade at the Justice Department, I had the IRS as my fundraiser and they were really good at it. I mean, they, they raised our money without fail. I knew I had a travel budget at the Justice Department without fail, but leaving to launch Human Trafficking Institute and having a bunch of friends who were sort of government lawyers or NGO people didn't, that, that knew they weren't going to fund it. They could, they're just trying to get food on the table, get their kids in school. And so uh, and I didn't have like a great network for that. But at some point we felt like, gosh, we've, uh, you know, my co-founder and I have felt like we, we vetted this idea long enough. Like we, we know this is a, a huge need that honestly, even if governments are super motivated to increase trafficking, they can shout down the chain of command to police and prosecutors and judges to get this fixed all they want. But if the police and prosecutors at the bottom of the chain are going, it's quite, actually quite specialized. We, we don't know how to do this. It's like putting a billion dollars on the table and and telling you or me to go do cataract surgery, right? At that point, it doesn't matter how smart we are or how well motivated we are or how incentivized we are. I don't. We just don't have the skills to do it. And we realize until you solve that problem globally, we can pour trillions of dollars into anti-trafficking efforts and see almost no reduction in the prevalence of trafficking. So and that that that's actually the one narrow thing that we know how to do. So let's take a risk and go do it. So I left to try and raise some seed capital. And I um, was just profoundly bad at it, I discovered, or uh, judging by the results. And then we were just very fortunate to have one or two people that came through early on and took a massive risk on us that just gave us enough runway to really have things take off. So do you do you run it as a business or a nonprofit? It's a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit. Yeah, it's a, yeah. yeah so I mean, it's a lot harder, I think, to raise for a nonprofit than it is to raise for a technology company in Silicon Valley. For sure. I remember sitting next to us, sitting, I was at a conference with a private equity guy who was sitting on my left and he said, oh, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm trying to raise the seed capital. Here's what I'm trying to do. He's like, oh, what are you trying to do in, this, in year one? I said, we're trying to raise a million dollars in the first year. He looked at me, he said, you got to rework this. That, that that will never work. He says, it's hard for, it's, I, I produce amazing returns as a, at my private equity firm. It's hard for me to raise a million bucks. You're doing a philanthropic, you know, return. Like that's, Super, super hard. Like you know, people, people, people relying on the goodness of people's hearts to give them a, to get a million dollars is just a huge challenge. And um, and so it's actually been quite amazing to see that there are just a lot of people who I think you know, if you look at all the issues that we talk about, there's almost always a vocal opposition. It's it's a, often the debate is should we or shouldn't we do this thing? And I, I can't think of a social issue almost really right now where there's not a, a hot debate. Except this. This is like the one thing where there is not, there's no longer any yeah. debate about should we or shouldn't we stop I'm pro this. pro-trafficking. Right, there's no, there's no pro-trafficking contingency that we don't want to offend. Yeah. And so it, the debate has fundamentally shifted to, okay, well, we all think this should stop. The question is, can we and how? And now for the first time, we've got really proven models that are measurably stopping traffickers. And I think, in my mind, going back to that divided soul kind of experience yeah. of like one part of you is like, this has to stop. And the other part's like, it's too big, nothing will change. What you really need, the thing that actually restores those two halves of your soul are, is this sense of like very tangible hope. Like A is doable, B is doable, C is doable. And collectively they result in not just a few victims being protected, but in massive drops in the prevalence of trafficking. And that really didn't exist when I learned about this 20 years ago, but it does now. And so I think, 
especially for those of us in a, 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 with, with significant circles of influence like you, I think this is an opportunity where we get to have a front row seat to, for the first time in history, watching widespread human trafficking fall at scale. Okay. And to me, that's a pretty exciting thing to be a part of. Uh, and my assumption, it is a problem that is, has been growing it's very hard to measure the growth of it because, because it you has don't know where been it is. so hidden. Yeah, now, yeah. we do have numbers. So we, we know that roughly the there's 25 million victims today that are in some version of either sex or labor trafficking. Now, that's a cross-section number because what happens is traffickers just churn through victims. So they mm -hmm. acquire new victims, they discard old victims. And so the actual number of people victimized is way, way, way higher than that. Uh, but that number can feel so debilitating if you don't have like a very tangible, if you don't have tangible help, if there's not like a very clear solution that can, can begin to address this at scale. How long has the Institute been running? So I left in 2015 to launch yeah. the Justice Department, to, to leave the Justice Department and get this launched. Seven years. So yeah, six, seven years. And so how big is the operation now? So we have 22 folks uh, globally, uh, but we operate through, so just to give you one concrete example, one of our partner countries is Uganda. So we work with the government of Uganda, which commits to build not just a specialized unit, but an entire new human trafficking department within the police force that they commit to staff with 250 police and staff. And then they allow us by agreement to operate inside that criminal justice system and drive cases forward through the, their own police and, and prosecutors. And so that's really one of the reasons why we're able to see such outsized impact is though our team is relatively small, is, is very small relative to the impact numbers that we're seeing, we're operating through this much larger group of people who ultimately are going to own this, right? So this is this is the goal is to ultimately create self-sustaining enforcement capacity, so that when these units can handle hit performance benchmarks and handle normal attrition, then Uganda is fully funding its own self-sustaining units. So you get all the ongoing protection with no additional philanthropic investment. And do any of the governments actually financially contribute towards what you're doing? Can you get funds from them? Yeah, so in the first round, our commitment to what we've asked for our partner countries to do is to say, hey, you have to form these new units mm -hmm. and you've got to take your own people, assign them to these units, fund all their salary and all their benefits from day one. And you've got to find your own men, own money to backfill the slots they vacated by that transfer, which is actually quite a big ask for, for these poor countries, for mm -hmm. poor, uh, economically poorer countries. And then we'll take care of the rest. Now, I think in five years, you could go to a country that is, uh, for instance, there are countries right now who are on the precipice of getting sanctioned because of their human trafficking practices. And if they, let's say they're looking at a $100 million sanctions risk. If we can help reduce that sanctions risk by 50%, that's a $50 million value proposition. So I think you could begin to say, hey, countries, this is actually, you, it's actually more expensive for you not to solve the problem than to use this replicable model to solve it. And that's where you can start getting funding at scale. So this is what right now we're kind of in this critical period over the next five to 10 years where we're proving out that this model actually works not just in the US, but in these very different countries and continents and contexts is, is critical data to help drive this to scale. It's, it's the impact that you can have globally in the scale of of the impact you can have currently limited by your budget. Yeah, I would yeah. say there's two there's two limiting factors. The biggest is 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 funding. Yeah. Um and philanthropic funding is just much less efficient capital distribution right now than other forms of funding, which is honestly one of the reasons why it's pretty exciting to see and I think this gets underplayed in the press, but to see like the Bitcoin community becoming actually this dominant engine of philanthropy on the planet. Yeah. I mean, people think about the Bitcoin community outside of it as, oh, but isn't Bitcoin associated with crime? And it has sort of this sort of negative reputation of yeah. being illicit or kind of dark in some way. And yet here you have these, you have this all this Bitcoin wealth and you have these, you have this community that's energized by building something that accomplishes something huge in a short period of time for the for the cause of human freedom. And so I think about that group and I think about here now we have this proven model that can actually you know, dramatically increase the number of traffickers stopped and victims protected. And I think this is where I could imagine you know, in five years, what if the Bitcoin community actually became famous for being the driving force behind bringing human freedom to trafficking at scale across the globe? I mean, that would be, as, as Bitcoin tries to gain broader adherence uh, and uh, more widespread adoption, 
you know, hyper Bitcoinization, I think, depends on having their, a, a shift among the larger public that's just not, that isn't getting to listen to your podcast, who isn't, who's still a little bit on the fringes of what is this all about? It feels very different. It feels new. I'm not so sure about it. Isn't it associated with crime? To see, hey, this is actually a group that's at the forefront of decimating something like modern slavery in a measurable way. That's the kind of thing that gets me excited. And when you look at the giving trends of the Bitcoin community, what's interesting is they're not like the traditional philanthropic community. They're not, they're not really interested in symphony tickets or you know, the art. I mean, they're, they're looking at where are their sort of game-changing impacts that if they were scaled would have world-changing effects and have world-changing cha- effects for human freedom. And, that, and that's, it's very, very interesting to read about that, that, that social movement that's, that's really going underappreciated of Bitcoin driving the, 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 fa- the face of philanthropy in a totally different way. Uh, how much work are you having to do to refill the funding each year? Is it is it a constant cycle or have you got regular funders? Because, uh, I mean, even if you ran a fundraiser and say you raised a number, five, say $5 million, $10 million, if that isn't consistently coming in, you don't want to scale and then have to, you know, then have to kind of reduce the size of the operation you're doing. I think repeat uh, donors is going to be super important to what you do. For sure, recurring donors are very valuable to what we do, and we have experienced like this really rapid growth. But the ch- our challenge, honestly, has been that we've seen a, even a much sharper growth in our impact. So, I'll, just let me give you a concrete example on this. So, in Uganda, what, you know, they commit to build this unit. I hire a prosecutor, uh, actually from Texas, who who's a 13 year prosecutor, uh, and he built the human trafficking prosecution unit just outside Houston. He and his wife and his three girls sell their house, they sell their cars, and they move to Kampala, Uganda to go lead this work. When he first started, I told him, hey, my goal in our first year is to see a 70% increase in the number of traffickers stopped through prosecution. And he looked at me like I had three heads. I mean, he said, are you, are you out of your mind? Like the, the US pilot on which this is based saw a 114% increase over two years. 70% is greater than half of that. And that's what you're asking for in one year with basically just me versus the entire resource of the federal government, that's insane. And this is all pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. And he said, all right, but you know, I, I like a challenge, so we'll go in and we'll try. And COVID hit, everything got harder. But by the end of the year, we had seen a 304% increase wow. in enforcement, the number of traffickers stopped. Now over two years, it's a 538% increase over two years. I mean, when I was at DOJ and we saw a 114% increase over two years, people were going crazy. Like, this is the game changer in trafficking. And now we're talking 538% increase with a much, much smaller investment of resources. So the awesome news about that is, I mean, you're talking 70, 70 to 75% of those victims are children. So those children are now in places where they're starting to be cared for. And now you're talking about almost 1,000 traffickers that are behind bars that aren't going to do this again. We've got our first ever life sentence of a trafficker a few months ago. Like tremendous movement that's happening. The challenge now is when you're talking about a 538% increase, increase instead of a 70% increase, that means there's a lot more cases that need attention. And we have this huge organizational risk. Like I, I can't afford to burn out my lead prosecutor or, or life happens and his parents get sick or his wife's parents get sick. He has to come back to Texas for eight months, devastates our impact. And there's a huge advantage to keeping the pedal on the ground because for traffickers, there's this flywheel effect that if you see a lot of enforcement barreling down at you very, very quickly, seeing big sentences, and it starts to feel like there's zero shot that I'm not going to get caught. And so I'm out. I'm just shifting to voluntary laborers. I'm shifting industries. I'm out. It's too risky. And so driving that deterrent impact depends on speed. And that's where, for us, we're like looking at this. And if we were, if I were a for-profit company, I would say, it's time to raise a Series B, right? We've got really unbelievable proof of concept. We benchmarked this against the global per capita average. And so Western Europe and the Western Hemisphere, collectively, they're about 1.7x the global average of human trafficking prosecutions. Not surprisingly, they have the most resources, the most expertise. Africa is about 0.9x the global average, lagging a little behind. Uganda, before we showed up, right at 0.9x, very average performer for Africa. After our, our embedded expert model, Uganda is now performing at almost 9x the global average. So not only are they, you know, 9x the global average, they're almost 5x the high performers that we're seeing in the Western Hemisphere in Europe. So we've got proof of concept. What we really need is growth capital. Um, and and that's just a less common concept in the nonprofit philanthropic yeah. space. 
But a community like this, a, a Bitcoin community, like you probably have p- listeners right now who in within 10 minutes could, you know, could, could change that. And, and that's the kind of thing that's quite exciting is, is you, you, you can, you build a revolution, not from the, the sort of old crusted philanthropic, uh, you know, uh, strategies of the past, but you have this, you know, you have this global currency that is now looking to solve a, a global problem to bring global freedom. And, th- and that's pretty exciting to me. There are billionaires who listen to the show. We know that factually. Yeah. <laughs> there are people with considerable wealth. Um, there's always a lot of demand on it, though. There's lots yeah. of problems in the world. And I, I agree with you. Uh, Bitcoin is a, uh, a very generous. And uh, if we can help support you with this, this would be great. What, what, what kind of numbers are game changers for you? you, you you've, es- you've essentially said you've, you've achieved product market fit. You now want to scale. Uh, I've got no idea the cost to run. What's the cost now to run the operation at 22? So our say? entire organization is operating on a $5 million budget. Annual. It's annual. Okay. Entire organization. So... What's a game changer for you? What, like, what, what kind of number if somebody came and said, I can just give you this? I mean, we can scale. I mean, $50 million really allows us to scale in a massive way. But even like a $5 million growth capital allows us to scale up in Uganda, build that proof of concept out so that you start to hit funding at scale. So uh, that that's really the biggest limiting factor is funding and then building that pipeline of embeds to drive these things forward and and so that's what we're working on and you're not just prosecuting traffickers my assumption is you're you're saving actual lives for sure yeah that, I mean, yeah so not just i mean you're physically saving lives but you're saving people's future mentally protecting them you're protecting families there must be other secondary effects of this as well yeah it's actually quite fascinating when you think about it because Many of us are already, uh, you know, fun, fun, maybe philanthropically funding other really great efforts. So you, you send money, for instance, just to Uganda to build great schools. There's literally, you know, a fantastic school in Uganda that's funded philanthropically. There you have an ama- amazing medical clinic and hospital over here. You have economic development and microenterprise over here. Well, what happens when all those incredibly important humanitarian uh, 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 initiatives are there? And the people that we're funding are there, and they can't actually reach the people that they're trying to serve because those people are literally walled off from all that development and public health intervention by a trafficker, by a brothel wall. What do you do? You can ask the hospital administrator to go take on a a trafficker or or the school administrator. Like, they can't do that. And so what, what we find is that trafficking begins to act as this bottleneck that chokes out the efficacy of these very, very important development and public health initiatives that are already in the very places where the trafficking victims are. And so if you can wedge open that bottleneck, there's already a lot of bandwidth there to meet those other needs. And that's one of the reasons why there's this uh, massive study that the World Bank did uh, a while back to look at what's the biggest driver of GDP. And what they found is that the largest predictor of GDP value is rule of law institutions. 57% of the intangible wealth, which makes up the majority of GDP, is driven actually by the effectiveness of rule of law institutions. And when there's not that, when you have those broken public justice justice systems that aren't actually protecting people from crimes like trafficking, you know, if you're not safe, nothing else matters. And yet, if we can actually wedge open that bottleneck, there's a lot of bandwidth there to address some of those other needs. So in that sense, it becomes an amplifier of these other investments that are too important to languish because we haven't addressed the trafficking problem. That's a highly relevant point to a lot of discussions we have where people are, there's a lot of, you know, we have a lot of libertarians listen to the show, uh, anarcho capitalists who believe centralized institutions have failed us and they're one of the primary problems in society. I disagree. I, th- I recognize there have been failings by governments, there have been failings by institutions, but there are, this is an, ex- this, this is an example of something which, uh, if you don't have centralized forces working on it, it's a problem that's hidden and a problem that I believe would grow. Um, so uh, we fully support you. Uh, uh, are you already raising Bitcoin? Do you have a Bitcoin donation address on your website? We do, actually. Okay, so great. I, I want to give actually a shout out to uh, to Alex Holmes and OpenNode, um, yeah. who came alongside and made it really easy for us to to launch and open make it easy for Bitcoiners to be engaged. And and to do so incredibly generously, he just is so moved by the mission that he's really not making 
any money off this, I think until until there's 10 million Bitcoin donations, 10 million in Bitcoin donations in the door. So, dude, I reckon you can twist his arm to never take it. <laughs> I imagine that's the case too. It, honestly, if we hit 10 million in Bitcoin donations after your show, that's a that's a good well, problem to have. So, I mean, <laughs> you may do, you may not. I mean, there's, uh, they're up. <laughs> There are people listening who can do that in one hit. I wonder if they would. Have you got any idea how much you've raised so much so far with Bitcoin? I don't know the exact numbers. We're okay. still right on the front end of that. So we'll be at the Bitcoin conference, and okay. then uh, we're trying to I- engage with the Bitcoin community through podcasts like this and through other and, and through other uh, folks. And and honestly, it seems like it's a it's a kind of community where you could have like a group of influencers that organically says, hey, this is going to be our deal. We're, like, we're going to kind of own this and figure out like creative ways to harness this, to drive this forward. And um, and and I think that would be awesome. I think that could be cool. So what's the water charity, Clean Water? Uh, charity Water? Charity, charity Water. water. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Scott, I'm so bad with names. Yeah. Scott Harrison? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, he, he had a very clear objective. Yeah. He said he wanted to raise a number. What was it? I think it was like 50 Bitcoin. And I think... The Winklevoss said they would match that. They were matching everything up to that, I think. Up yeah. to that? I think or so. Did, no, or didn't they say they would match it if it hit 50 Bitcoin? That's uh, right. They locked it up and would yeah. unlock it if it matched, I think. I, I feel like if you had a like if you had a number, yeah. like I think that you could even record it on the website, it just felt like it was a goal you could put people towards. That's a great idea. I mean, and, and I think we have some folks who might, might be open to, to doing a kind of match like that as well to yeah. really... Uh, amplify the impact of it. I mean, if you get a hundred Bitcoin, that's f- five million ish. Yeah, forty four and a half million. Uh, if you get a thousand Bitcoin, that's forty five million. Uh, we will absolutely support you in this. We yeah. will donate. We will absolutely help you. This Thank is you. Uh, a super um, uh, important issue. I feel like you need. If you made a campaign, I'm just a marketing guy, right? Yeah, I'm a marketing guy. I like marketing, and I feel like if you had a campaign that people mm. could attach to, yes. Then th- this might drive it forward. Charity Water got that donation as well. They got there. They, they've raised over 100 Bitcoin now. Over 100 Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Incredible. What have I not asked, asked you that, that I should have asked you or that was part of this story that needs to be told? The opportunity to, um, to see the, the scale of this happen, uh, especially in the next several years, so that you have this sort of the de- demonstrated uh, impact that can help you unlock much, much larger scaling funding is, is like a really exciting thing for me. And, and I hope for this community. And I, and I uh, am encouraged by the fact that, that this community is focused in on how do we achieve high impact, high yield impact through our, through our philanthropy and, uh, and the ta- even, you know, learning about the sort of the, the, the tax advantages that exist for, for giving Bitcoin, which are, especially in the U.S., that, that are quite, uh, make it quite a, quite a, a efficient way to give as well is a, is a kind of exciting and maybe um, underappreciated by the larger uh, community uh, opportunity to to really make an impact through through what donations. Kind of, and what kind of material exists if people want to read more? Have you made videos, films? Uh, articles, what exists? Yeah, so um, the best resources are on our website, traffickinginstitute.org. And we do have, you know, uh, little short video clips and uh, explanations of how this works. And then there's an annual report that you can download where you can see, hey, this is the sort of impact that we're seeing on the ground. And then if you're interested in the U.S., uh, in particular, we have now, like I said, all these cases and trends mapped in the U.S. So you can actually go to a map of the U.S. and even look at your specific state and see how does my state stack up and how it's enforcing these laws. So it's a it's a great resource to see. Hey, what what's going on even locally for me in my own state, uh, as well as seeing like the national trends that are happening. So that's a good that's that's a great resource to go to. You could make a a good short documentary about this to help people understand. The issue as well, perhaps somebody going out to somewhere like Uganda and showing the impact of the work. Yeah, that would be amazing. So documentarians that are listening to this, reach out to me. We'd love to talk. The only thing I didn't ask you, but I think is a relevant question. Um, is there a negative Bitcoin side to the story? Is this something traffickers are, are using to fund their operations? Is it something we need to be aware of? Uh, I, I know it's a tricky question, but... I... There, the answer is yes. We do see traffickers use Bitcoin. We see them use it in a couple of different ways. Um, we often see traffickers in the U.S. that are are using Bitcoin to post ads of victims on websites where they advertise uh, commercial sex, and then we see it used in purchasing um, child sexual abuse materials or what what sometimes 
It used to be yeah. called child pornography. And so that's- but Why is it, it's been renamed? I think, I think the, the idea is that, you know, some people consume pornography and to just add child before it, maybe doesn't feel- Minimizes it. Minimizes it, it yeah. in some way, when really it's, it's, it's sexual abuse of children that's happening yeah. and being captured. And so I think that's the vision behind that shift in name. Uh, but that, that's where we see it too. It's a, and there was a, uh, actually an amazing case that originated out of the IRS who was looking at large scale drug trafficking in Thailand and came across a, really, which is the largest dark web provider of, uh, of child sex abuse material and ended up um, shutting it down, resulted in over, I think, 300 arrests oh, wow. uh, in uh, I think 38 different countries. Foreign Policy did a story on it at the beginning of this year. And so um, I think the good news is that Bitcoin is also being used, I think, uh, as a tool by law enforcement to help identify cases. And in a sense, you know, if you have a cash exchange in a back alley, the only witnesses are the two people who are having the exchange. Uh -huh. But in a sense, with, with blockchain, you have the entire globe servicing, serving as a witness. And so there are ways in which law enforcement can find Bitcoin as an effective tool to identify uh, cases and pursue cases that they wouldn't otherwise get to do. So I think it, we should acknowledge like, yes, it is true that Bitcoin is being used in crime. I think that does get overstated and people, especially when you hear uh, uh, you know, senior government officials saying that's the primary use of Bitcoin, it's primarily used illicitly. Uh, I don't think the evidence supports that, but I do think there, there is, I think the government accountability office of the US government did do a large scale study that came out at the beginning of this year saying, hey, there is Bitcoin being used increasingly in human trafficking and drug trafficking. So I, I do think it is out there and uh, it's just like any other tool. It can be used for good or it can be just like cash, right? It can be used for good or it can be used for, for, for to, to, to exploit and cause harm. And, uh, but I do think that the, the opportunity for Bitcoiners to build the reputation of actually using their resources to oppose this kind of crime is, it, is, a, is a unique opportunity to really shift the way that the public sees all this. Okay. Well, look, we, we, we want to support you in what you're doing. Um, let's try or you devise some way of uh, making this a, a marketing thing. <laughs> uh, some people wouldn't like that, but I marketing works. Uh, we will donate and support your cause and we will help promote it uh, with the show. We can promote it on Twitter, uh, on our email. We can get it out to everybody. But yeah, let's devise something and, and support you in doing this. Let's help you raise more money to this. It, it feels like a, an amazing thing you're doing. Um, and congratulations for how far you've got it so far. Um, I definitely think it's something celebrated because you are changing people's lives, which is incredible. Um, just remind everyone where to follow the work you're doing. And if people want to get in touch, how they get in touch with you. Yeah, so you can follow us at traffickinginstitute.org. Uh, that's our website. And then you can uh, reach out to us by email. Uh, you can reach out to me personally at victor.boutros at traffickinginstitute.org. And uh, would love love to, to be in touch with folks. Great. Well, we'll continue to support you. And uh, yeah, good luck with your work. It's incredible to hear and appreciate you coming in to tell us what you've been doing. Thanks, Peter.